back guys, and well, it has been some time since we last discussed about the Tomb Raider series, but finally, uh, after some delay, I'm bringing you part 2 of the retrospective. Uh, I must say that Lara has been quite busy since she took care of Natalie's goons, and well, apparently she wasn't the only one, as I took more time than, well, anticipated in making this one, but as they say, better late than ever. Uh, but speaking of which, maybe I won't take much more time and let's talk about the second installment of the series, Tomb Raider 2, starring Lara Croft. From Tomb Raider to Superstar, Lara has been the center of attention after her first adventure. Not only she started being treated as a real person, but also as an icon. You could find her anywhere, from magazine covers to ads for cars, TV commercials and even labeled in several beverages. Lara was everywhere. Not to mention that some brands also use her as a representative. During this time, Lara was also heavily sexualized, appearing in some commercial spots with, well, very short garments or even less, prompting Toby Guard, that wasn't okay at all with the situation, to completely leave core design to only return later on for the Tomb Raider Legend game. Unfortunately, Shelley Blonde didn't reprise her role as Lara due to other commitments. However, some of her audio cues were kept in this game. Jeffith Gibbons was selected to replace her, giving voice to the iconic character for two games. Tomb Raider 2 is proof that sequels can actually be good. Lara no longer has her, well, triangular assets, uh, and the new model presents a more rounded figure. The developers were also able to add her ponytail to match the model in the FMVs. Beside the physical changes, a new set of movements were added to our friend, which made controlling her much easier. For example, she can now climb ladders, roll while in midair or underwater. Considering that this adventure is more dangerous than the first one, her arsenal was also expanded, adding three additional weapons to the previous four we had in the first installment. The team also upgraded the TR engine for this game enabling dynamic lightning, which also brought flares to the game, which were very useful considering some dark corners we encountered during the adventure. To be honest, this is one of my favorite entries in the series. Tomb Raider 2 presents longer levels with more details and mechanics, a complete story with more cutscenes and a set of places that are clearly an upgrade when comparing with the previous one. Does this make a better game? Well, it's hard to say. As with all these improvements, some downgrades are also present, but we'll talk about that later. Before starting our new adventure, let's go back to the Croft Manor. People who played the first game will be pleased to see an improved mansion. Not only we can explore a little more of the house, as this will be our first time visiting the gardens outside. The game also introduced us Winston, Laura's faithful butler that follows her everywhere. And yes, yes, as the kid that she is, Lara can actually lock the farting old man in the freezer. Must be tough to work for her. Oh, and uh, fun fact, this wasn't even intended by the development team. The gym has kind of been moved outside with additional platform that will introduce Lara's new movements. This time she will be able to climb ladders, a task that must have been quite hard to master, I must say. For the most adventurous, a maze has been added, hiding some interesting secrets and a button that opens a way to Lara's secret vault. And yes, this is all gold. Looks like Tomb Raiding pays off. The game starts in China, where we witness a battle that took place near the Great Wall between warriors and monks, with the warriors having the help of a giant dragon. Right there, we can see the improvements in the CGI cutscenes that presents more details and polished models than the first game. The bloody battle quickly ends once one of the monks removes what seems to be a dagger that was in the dragon's belly. Said dagger is then sealed in an unknown location so that it couldn't be used anymore. 
we start our adventure in what's left of the Great Wall. To be honest, I'm amazed the team didn't stick with the approach they had in the first installment. In this game, first level doesn't mean easy level. It's clear that the developers intended us to complete the manor before starting a new game. And you better get used to it, as it will only get harder from this point onward. Lara will be welcomed with all sorts of traps that will test her reflexes, and I assure you, you will fail. A lot. But thankfully, you can now save anywhere on every platform, and not just on PC like it was the case with Tomb Raider 1. Just make sure not to save right before a complicated situation where you are about to die. We will also soon discover that the secret system has been revamped. Most of the levels will feature three dragon figures, silver, gold and jade. Upon collecting all three secrets, we will be rewarded with goodies. And for the one that are wondering... Yes, I miserably once again failed most of the secrets. I confess I'm a terrible Tomb Raider. Well, good thing this game should have been called Hit Woman. You'll understand soon enough. After killing some spiders, endangered species, dodging some boulders and preventing being impaled, Larry will encounter some T-Rexes for some reason. These seem a little tougher than the one found in the Lost Valley. But, as you imagine, nothing our friend can kill. It's also in the beginning of the game that we can clearly understand that they wanted a more story-driven adventure, as we will be presented with more FMVs and cutscenes, giving more charm to our friend. Not only that, but Larry will have new audio cues when picking up items trying to make... Uh -huh. To make... Uh -huh. To make... Uh -huh. To... Uh -huh. To... Uh -huh. uh, uh, make... Could you please stop picking up stuff? Thank you! And yes, this sound cue while picking up stuff will get annoying. A hard lesson learned as this won't be coming back in the next entries. After reaching the end of the first level, Larry will be blocked by some door with a strange logo and a keyhole. Attacked by some mysterious man, she soon discovers that she is not the only one after the dagger. A cult gang seems to be searching for it as well. But before trying to get more information, she... well, literally let the man commit suicide. I mean, pretty sure it wasn't a bottle full of booze. But anyway, she will soon witness the wonders of Chinese technology, as the Great Neural was equipped with Wi-Fi back in 97. Not to mention how easy it was to Google a cult's address back then. After a thorough online search, Lara heads to Venice, where she hopes to find Bartoli's hideout and the key to the locked door in China. Right in the beginning of this level, we will witness the huge limitation of Lara's combat skills against armed enemies. Uh, remember Pierre from Tomb Raider 1? Well, this got worse. A lot worse. As enemies can easily hit you, even if they are not pointing at the right direction. In addition, you will find moments when an enemy can easily target Lara, but not the other way around, like this guy on the balcony. And this is only the beginning, as they will appear in all the places, and sometimes in situations when you can't even fight back straight away. Thankfully, this game is more generous in medipacks, maybe a way to counter such limitations. Regular enemies, like dogs or goons with a bait, will continue to be easy to dodge and kill. Oh, and for the love of God, forget about the M16, the new automatic weapon in Lara's arsenal, as the weapon sucks if you want to shoot while jumping and dodging. This is also where we start to notice that levels are a bit more open than the ones found in the previous installment, of course, with the same kind of puzzles that is, platforming, switches, and keys. After taking care of the first enemies, Larry will find a boat that will be useful later on. Our first goal will be to open the boathouse's gates. Some easy platforming, balcony jumping, and there is the key. In our way back, we will also stop to pull a switch to open a door that will lead us to the next section. Stealing boats and damaging private property will be Lara's new hobby, as you will soon find out. The addition of vehicles was a great idea which will prove useful, but being a little hard to handle at times. 
This was also a great way to add new platforming to the game. Some of the section in Tibet will need to make calculated jumps with the snow motorbike. The boat will be a key element in this level, as it will help us, well, to get to several places and get rid of some mines that were added in the canal for some reason. Mm, possibly a new touristic attraction. After blasting our way into that closed door, we finally reach Bartoli's hideout that will be full of enemies. This will be the perfect occasion to see the first take on a more urban scenery. In fact, this game's locations are quite recent when compared with the first one. The developers also added more details to level design, adding more 3D objects and textures to give more life to the game, maybe something that was made possible with the engine's upgrade. This helped in having a more convincing game design and also adding some platforming through some decaying parts of the building, like this damaged floor that is used as a platform to climb. Of course, the design philosophy of the first game was used in this one as well. I must admit, Bartoli seems to have put zero investment in his hideout, considering how easy it was to get in and all the hazardous things Lara found. Broken balconies, floated areas, gas pipes that exploded… well, he clearly doesn't care about health and safety. Uh, I just hope he has a good insurance for his staff. Uh, not that it matters, considering they are in Lyra's way. After crossing part of Venice, dramatically increase the attrition rate of Bartoli's shady organization, infiltrate a not-so-secret cult hideout and blowing up said hideout, Lara finds herself in some kind of opera house that also seems to serve as a warehouse for some goods for the Italian gang. This level introduces a new set of traps and puzzles. Uh, here we feel things are getting harder. Uh, some of the traps are deadlier than before. Some of the puzzles and platforming will also make us think twice uh, on how to approach a challenge, as one miscalculation can lead to Lara's death. And believe me, uh, this opera house is full of faulty stuff trying to kill our friend. At the end of the level, we will also encounter some kind of mini-boss, a guy with two big barrel guns that can be easily killed if you decide not to drop down from the wooden crate. It's amazing how Lara maintains her cool with all this killing. The level ends with Lara getting in Bartoli's plane, where he is discussing his evil plan with the pilot. Not sure if it's a good idea to have him co-piloting the plane, considering the massive conjunctivitis behind his shades. Anyway, after conveniently eavesdropping the conversation, Lara gets knocked out by one of the goons that was hiding somewhere. Bartoli will take Lara to his offshore rig instead of, well, disposing of her for some reason. I swear, bad guys always lose because they are too soft with their enemies. Lara will wake up in a room that is being used as a cell and will notice her equipment was removed. And, uh, well, for some reason, not only she was left in a room with windows that are easily breakable, as the switch to open the door is also present. After leaving the very escapable cell, we will need to get around the place and avoid enemy contact as we can't defend ourselves. It's also important to watch out for traps as this place structure, well, like most of Bartoli's locations, is very unstable. Lara will need to swim her way around while avoiding harpoons and get access to the plane in order to retrieve her dual pistols. And yes, she will lose all the other weapons she collected, but I must say, they, it will be quite easy to get them back. Uh, and please, be careful with the turbines. Uh, don't want to make minced croft, do you? It's in this section that we will start to see what I consider to be poor level design. Uh, you see, Tomb Raider has always been a game with a lot of trial and error, where death is part of the experience. But this entry takes it to the next level, as you will face moments of certain death. Well, like this one, as you will inevitably die well, if you decide to go down facing the right way. But the worst one must be this fall in the wreck of the Maria Doria level, where you will surely die if not falling with the full health. Gladly, the developers left a big medipack near, almost as if they knew what would happen. People were more forgiving with games back then. If this was launched nowadays, we would have everyone raging on Twitter because of this. Thank God we can save anywhere. 
First comers will also be surprised with a new type of enemies. Some guys using flamethrowers. Uh, well, while it can be hard to avoid the flames, these are quite easy to kill as they have less health than the regular ones. I mean, have you heard them breathe? Uh, it's like they are about to collapse. Well, no wonder considering the huge gas tank they are carrying around. The offshore rig section is quite small, presenting two levels with easy traps to evade and some platforming, where a misstep will result in huge backtracking, uh, well, like this tank area where a miscalculated jump will make you repeat everything. This is also the first game with a huge ladder part. I know, I know, we all know the snake eaters joke right now, but one question remains. Do you prefer snake climbing with the background music or Lara with her grunt? After dealing with some puzzles and killing more of Bartoli's staff, well, I think the guy must have hell of a recruitment team, uh, we reach a place where a monk is being tortured by Bartoli in order to have some information about the Seraph, some kind of key that will unlock the way in a monastery in Tibet to another key that will open the door that leads to the dagger. After saving him from what's left of the rig staff, he will tell us more about the Seraph and what Bartoli is looking for, while Lara is changing to a diving suit. Bartoli, well, that apparently still hasn't used any eye drops, kills a monk before he's able to say more. Looks like Lara's reaction time to save people still hasn't improved since Tomb Raider 1, as she could have counterattacked right after the first shot, instead of waiting for the second one. I know, the guy had a silencer attached to the gun, but well, she was facing the monk and could have easily seen the bullet impact. Also, Bartoli decided to continue to spell Lara, as he could have easily shot her first, and the monk after. Oh well, video games. After escaping Bartoli, whose aim decreased dramatically, she dives to hitch a ride on some kind of yellow subversive that takes her to an abandoned underwater shipwreck. The next section of the game is one of my least favorite in the series. Not only it has a lot of level design flaws, as the levels are very bland and overwhelcome their stay, despite showing some neat locations. Right at the beginning of the level, we are left in the middle of nowhere, with a limited time to find out where we need to go. There are some seaweeds that will lead the way, but they are very easy to miss, and once you reach the ship, you need to understand how to get in. I know game engines were a little more limited back then, but I'm sure they could have used some kind of huge chain or something to better show us the way. And, spoiler alert, this kind of unclear underwater path way will repeat during the section. Something I kept asking myself in the underwater levels is how they managed to transport that many people in the shipwreck. I mean, I was expecting some kind of excavation team, of course, but not all the armed force that was present. And, at this point, they start being a little repetitive as the enemy's difficulty hasn't increased and their AI is as bad as in the first level. We can clearly see that the developers tried to bring something new and fresh uh, with this section. An underwater level, a shipwreck, turn upside down, and levels that could change with some puzzles, like this dumping area, for example. While the idea was great, the limited movements of Lara and the way the game engine works impacted the level design and turned a great idea into a boring one. Uh, don't get me wrong, uh, there are strong moments in the Maria Doria, but this is clearly one of the weakest sections in the classic series. Uh, for example, the level Living Quarters looks like anything but actual living quarters of a ship. And when analyzing all levels of this section, we can't understand if the developers wanted to make a cruise ship or a cargo ship. There is not a lot of consistency in the design and textures. Not to mention that not all sections of the ship were designed upside down. Well, in that case, let's just imagine that it was split into two, uh, as we need to swim between two sections, and one was left upside down and the other no. I know, I know, I'm being a little too harsh for a game that was released in the 90s, but considering that Tomb Raider 1 did a better job presenting the whole setting, I think the same degree of consistency could have been brought to this one. Alright, enough ranting. After exploring all that the Maria Doria and its surrounding have to offer, and 
of course, dispose of all Bartulis goons, we finally reach the end of this section where Lara will need to collect several keys to open the cargo room that is storing the Seraph. Well, time to leave this wet and humid place and return to the rig where Lara will change back to her signature clothing and steal a plane that she can pilot like the true adventurer that she is. I mean, <laughs> in that Jones could, why couldn't she? After crashing her plane, because she forgot to refill the gas tank, Lara finds herself in the middle of a Tibetan foothills. The Tibet section is one of the strongest, in my opinion, despite a huge flaw well, that we'll cover later on. It has a diverse presentation, an interesting setting and good puzzles, not to mention that the enemies are much stronger than before, maybe too strong at times. We will begin by crossing some snow plains while avoiding deadly falls and traps. Boulders will be present in almost every corner of the level better be careful. I suspect they are used to work as some kind of avalanche. I keep being amazed with Lara's resistance to the cold. Not only she's wearing small shorts in Tibet, as diving into cold water doesn't seem to bother her at all. This level will also introduce us to the snow motorbike that can be quite frustrating at times, principally when we have to do some platforming with it, as we will use it to jump, well, over some kind of cliffs, or cross places where Lara would simply slide, and <laughs> controlling it can be quite challenging at times, principally in narrow spaces. I admit, I enjoyed running over enemies with it, I just hope she doesn't do the same while driving cars in London. After crossing the foothills and unexplainably survive this motorbike fall, Lara reaches the monastery, one of my favorite levels. This level can be tricky, as you can easily end up shooting monks, which would be a mistake. You see, right in the beginning of the level, we will see the monks battling against Bartolis goons. You can help them, which would be the most honorable thing to do, but Lara keeps on aiming at the monks for some reason, and shooting them would result in all of the monks being against you, which can be complicated, as they will be very useful during the level. The monastery will present us with a very neat setting and interesting platforming. Lara will have the opportunity to visit some corners of the interior as also some of its surrounding, in order to gather items that will unlock the way to a door where, of course, the seraph will be useful. The way the level is built also gives us the feeling that this is the place where the monks were prepared to guard the talion, the key that would lead to the dagger and stop anyone trying to get it. <laughs> well, except for Lara for some reason. Definitely one of the richest levels in the game. The next levels of Tibet will also present a lot of challenges. Platforming here has been made so that Lara needs to calculate some of the jumps. Being unattentive or hasty could result to her death, and believe me, this section has a lot to throw at us. This is also where we are presented with a new and awful mechanic, uh, some kind of platform that will push Lara upwards. In theory, this is a very neat thing, but it's badly executed, as you can't really control the direction where she is sent and will most of the times end up breaking her neck. Regarding this, the developers must have received the feedback, as this wasn't used the same way in the following entries. This is also where we are presented with a new type of enemy, the Yeti. Nothing that the grenade launcher can take care of. Oh, oh, and yes, you can start using your grenades against them, as this weapon won't be very useful against the last boss, as it reduces a little Laris dodging's ability. I must say that Lara is truly an echo terrorist. I mean, considering all the amount of endangered species she kills and all the things she explodes and destroys, not to mention the places she ruined. After surviving all what the cold tomb of Tibet has to offer, we will eventually meet the Guardian of the Talion that was inspired on the Garuda, a mythical creature. The half bird, half man boss will make sure that Lara won't get. Oh, oh, wait, looks like he's gone. After leaving the monastery, Lara will sneak around some guys guarding the area and steals a jeep from Bartoli's forces. I have to say, this scene could have come from a spy's movie, as she clearly knows how to make an escape with a boo. No! 
After fooling what remains of the cult, Lara heads back to the Great Wall of China, where she will use the Tylion to open the way to her final prize, the Dagger of Xi'an. Looks like we are where it all began, but this time with a different tone and setting. After opening the way to the dagger, Lara quickly runs toward its direction to grab and finally end one more adventure. Oh snap! <laughs> Thought it would be that easy, didn't you? She's not getting anything before passing some physical tests, of course. Before reaching the dagger, Lara will be brutally sent to an undersection of the wall. I keep wondering how they built that place ages ago. Well, anyway, as you guessed it, we will be presented with more platforming, puzzles and enemies. And boy, China has some rather unique platforms to cross. If you played the first game, you will notice that Tomb Raider 2 didn't escape the darker tone that is usually present in the last section. The environments are darker, bloodier and the soundtrack uses some notes and beats that will make our anxiety rise. At this point, you should be used to most of the things the game has to throw at Lara. Some platforming, puzzles, enemies to kill and... Oh, god damn it! that's a huge spider! Looks like mommy wants to have a revenge for the small ones we killed in the first level. The first level of the final section is quite open, as there is a connection between most corners of it. Of course, Lara will need to use her skills to get to most places and retrieve the keys that will open the way to the upper level. After all, we need to get back up to snatch that precious dagger. Like the monastery in Tibet, the levels in China will present rich details and several types of traps and way to reach new areas. And yes, these blasted bouncing platforms are back. And no, they are not easier to use. After surviving the most challenging climb in Lyra's journey, we finally return to the room where the dagger is. However, it seems we were a bit too late, as the cult kinda sacrificed Bartoli stabbing him with the dagger before taking him to some mythical section of the wall. So many people died for that. Oh well. Lyra decides to follow them, reaching one of the weirdest areas in the series, the Floating Islands. A level where Lara is greeted with, and yes, I kid note, floating islands that seem made of jade, considering the color and scenery. After all these years, I can't decide if I like this level or not. Don't get me wrong, it has some interesting bits and can be quite challenging, but I always end up having mixed feelings about it. For this part of the game, I suggest using the M16 and the grenade launcher, as enemies are quite hard. Right at the beginning of the level, you will encounter some kind of floating Chinese warrior. The level will have some of these. Nothing that the M16 can handle, as they take some time to reach you. As for the walking version of them, just use your grenade launcher. One of the reasons that made me feel mixed about this level is how confusing it can be. The path you take is not very clear. The good thing is that you can choose the order you do some things. The save system will also be your friend, as I suggest saving regularly as the level presents several jump sections that can be fatal. Other than that, you will find the typical dangers that we found in the other levels, and oh, be careful with the zip lines. you are not supposed to go until the end in some situations. Once Lara has taken care of business, it's time to get to the dragon's lair and retrieve our prize. I mean, she has been through hell to have that butter knife. The last level of China is quite small, you will be killing some warriors and some of Bartoli's goons, because yes, they never end, and finally the big boss. Bartoli's sure has changed in the last couple of minutes, he's mm, taller than I remember. Taking care of him will be quite easy, I suggest using the Yuzi, running and jumping around the thing. At some point the dragon will fall, showing the way to the dagger that is stuck in his torso. Go on, it's yours. Of course, taking the dagger will kill the dragon and, for some reason, make the whole area collapse. Time to make a run! While escaping, Lara is projected by the blast and knocked off. The end. Nah, I'm kidding. She wakes up some hours later, witnessing the destruction she caused. Hmm, well, business as usual, looks like it. Time to go home.
Man, this has been quite the adventure. I wonder what Clara is going to do with her new knife. But before that, it's time to get some rec- or maybe not. For some reason, the remaining forces of Bartowi's cult decided to hunt Clara to get back the dagger and take revenge on their leader's death. What a devoted team. And apparently they googled Lara's house as well using the laptop of the first level, considering how easy it was to find her. To be honest, I love the way they decide to end this game. Transforming Lara's house into the final level was a great idea and, in a sense, deepened the connection we had with her. I only pity the people that decide to trespass her property. I mean, do you remember how she treated them in their territory? Imagine what she would do to thieves in her house. Try to picture an angry woman in her robe running around with a shotgun shooting people. <laughs> Scary, I know. While running around the house taking care of what remains of the cult, I keep wondering where Winston is. Ah, butlers are not what they used to. Oh, right, he's still in the freezer. And Jesus, the alarm has been ringing for ages. Where the hell is the police? Well, thank God Lara can fend for herself, considering how efficient law enforcement is in her area. And that's it. It was the very last of Bartoli's staff, officially extinct. It has been a very long run, but before the game ends, Lara asks if we haven't already seen enough. And to be honest, well, I'm not sure what to answer. While Tomb Raider 2 is a huge improvement when comparing with its predecessor, it's also a game with some flaws. Level design problems, some puzzles that left a sour taste, and a game that at times seems to overstay its welcome. Well, don't take me wrong, I love this game and it has one of my favorite settings in the series. But at some time I start feeling a pattern and this will only get worse later on in the series as we will see with Tomb Raider 3, as this adventure came to an end. And that's it for Lara Croft, well, at least for this adventure, as she will be back in Tomb Raider 3. Uh, and regarding the second one, guys, let me know in the comments what you think about this game, if you liked it or not, because as we know, in the community, it's a game with, like, mixed feelings. Regarding this video, as usual, thank you very much for being here with me, and I do hope to see you in the next one, and as always, take care.